I right. interviewed you for the Croods uh, a few uh, years ago. Uh, and Bully, the Spider-Verse. I mean... <laughs> Any movie you guys are curious about, shout it. Ghost Rider! Ghost Rider! Ghost Rider! Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider. Yes! I'd like to make a movie here. Yes, you know, like I like it. Oh. We're going to do even better than that. The warmest Red Sea Film Festival welcome for Academy Award winner Nicolas Cage. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me to your beautiful country. They're so excited. They were cheering on every single Thank film. Thank you. Look at that. Nice to see you. How do you see all of you here? Thank you for coming around. Yeah. Love you too. Love you too. This is nice. Good energy in this room. Absolutely. Yeah. I told them not to hesitate to cheer every time we mention a movie okay. of yours that they like. So let's see how many times they cheer. I'll take it. Wild and hard. There you go. This here jacket is a symbol of my individuality, my belief in personal freedom. <laughs> from the beginning everyone is an artist in your family did you ever want to do anything else than be a performer uh sure i wanted to be a fisherman i uh, really did i i was going to try to make it as an actor and if it didn't happen i was going to get on a boat uh, all my friends in high school were going up to alaska and they were coming home in these corvettes and camaros and i was like well you guys are getting paid real well to go fishing in alaska and I thought, okay, well, I'll write a short story or maybe a book like my heroes, like Conrad or Melville. But fortunately, I, I started working as an actor, so Plan B didn't, never came to fruition. <laughs> Have you ever played a fisherman? Oh, yeah, I used to go fishing all the time with my, with my dad, and uh, I enjoy fishing. Yeah, yeah. But you haven't played one? No, not yet. I got close. I was almost uh, in a movie called The Perfect Storm, and it didn't work yeah. out because I, I, I was double booked with Gone in 60 Seconds, so I couldn't do the George Clooney part in The Perfect Storm. Well, someday, somehow. Uh, do you feel that it's visceral acting, that, you know, from a very young age, someone is an actor? Someone feels that calling of acting? Um, I think that if you want to find out if a little one in your family is an actor, put like a, a, a fake phone in their hand and see how they talk on the phone and you'll know whether they're an actor or not, how well mm. they communicate like there's someone on, on the line when there isn't. But I think that um, for me, it just seems so abstract. It started at such an early age. I would watch the television. And these people, these tiny people, when I was like three, four, five, inside the TV were so much more interesting than the people in my living room that I wanted to get inside the TV. So I think that was my first idea, that I wanted to be an actor. What did you watch growing up? The characters in films, the actors that resonated the most for you? I was almost uh, psychic about Jerry Lewis. Uh, <laughs> I used to love watching his funny comedies like Nutty Professor and uh, The Delicate Delinquent. And I would just sit at the, in front of the TV and w will for him to come on the, 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 the television. And then more often than not, he did. And I had so much fun watching Jerry Lewis. And then I was a fan of, uh, uh, they would do this, uh, movie of the week, the million dollar dollar movie they called it, and Charles Bronson would be in that with like Once Upon a Time in the West, or and then they would do these uh, almost like episodic TV shows with Rock Hudson, McMillan and Wife, or uh, Dennis Weaver and McLeod, and I just loved watching it. And then I, I liked whales, and I, like Jerry Lewis, I, I wanted to wait for Moby Dick to come on, and I just loved that movie. It, it terrified me, and uh, uh, excited me and I, I love Gregory Peck and that as Captain Ahab so all these and Godzilla of course I, I, I wanted to watch all the Godzilla movies as a boy so I was always interested in, in movies at a very early age you come from a famous cinematic name which you changed at some point of your career exactly for the reason that we're here today nobody actually knows that you are a Coppola how important was it to make your own mark 
Well, you see, I think a lot has been said about why I changed my name, and there's two different reasons. One reason is I did a little movie called Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and uh, I was about 16. Yes, so <laughs> I must have auditioned for that movie a million times, but they didn't cast me as uh, Brad. Judge Reinhold got that part. But when I was on set, I think some of the other, we were all very young, but some of the other actors couldn't receive that I had any talent because they thought I'm only here because I'm Coppola's nephew. So I changed my name. They would quote lines from Apocalypse Now, like I love the smell of Nicholas in the morning instead of I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Oh, ridiculous. But that wasn't the real reason. I think I, I was prescient that um, Directors, filmmakers are a pretty egocentric bunch and they're a very competitive group and I didn't think any filmmaker in their own right would want the name Coppola above the title of their movie. So I changed my name predominantly for business reasons. But it worked because basically it, it, it took very little time before you were only known as Nicolas Cage. That's a testament. Well, what happened was, and I have to give all the credit to Martha Coolidge, mm. She uh, was casting a movie Martha called Coolidge Valley Fans. Girl, and uh, I had already changed my name to Cage, and I guess she was tired of all the so-called pretty boys that were coming into her office, and she literally went to a stack of photos and found my 8x10 and said, I want a kid that looks like this. <laughs> and she didn't know I was related to anybody, and she called me in and I read for it, and I got the part, and nobody knew. And that was like uh, like a weight had been lifted off of me. Like I it was like I believed it. She got me to a point where I could believe in myself, that I could do it on my own steam. And she gave me a great note in uh, one of her directions. I was doing the scene at the door with Deborah Foreman, and I played it very distraught and very. I was in tears. Blah blah blah. And she said, "You know, you're hurt, but you're not defeated." And I took that direction to heart for everything I've done since. And I think I have to give all the credit to Martha Coolidge. She discovered Nicolas Cage. There would be no such thing as Nicolas Cage if there wasn't Martha. Why Cage? Uh, I was looking for a name. I went through a few different names. Some of them are completely absurd, like Nicholas Faust. Well, you know, isn't that a name for the devil? And Nicholas Blue, because blue is my favorite color. But I knew I wanted a name that was short and sweet yeah. and a little exotic. And I was reading Marvel Comics, and there was a character called Luke Cage. Pop. Yes! Right? Who's a cool character with a cool name. And uh, subsequently, my older brother was listening to John Cage, which I thought was curious because the avant-garde composer was interesting, but I just thought he had a cool name too, so I said, Cage is it, and immediately it, 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 it clicked. But I think Nick Cage actually sounds better than Nicholas Cage, but I went with the Nicholas anyway. Mm -hmm. Looks nice and sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> Let's start with the early on films that were, you know, popular movies before you became yourself a big star. The Cotton Club and Peggy Sue Got Married. Interesting films at the beginning of your career. Yeah, I mean, I was blessed to work with Francis. I'm blessed to have been born in a family of talented artists. Absolutely. Um, and with, with him, it's like he's, in many ways, he was like another father to me. And what, what am I gonna do to say no to my uncle? I mean, I, I, and I knew when I turned down uh, Peggy Sue several times, it was starting to really frustrate him. And last thing I wanna do is, uh, you know, piss my uncle off. So I said, <laughs> okay, let's, let's go. But I had to find a way into the character that made it interesting for me. So I started experimenting with changing my voice, a little more Jerry Lewis, doing things that were perhaps not exactly what you know Kathleen Turner or the studio had in mind. What about the Cotton Club? Yeah, the Cotton Club too. I mean, I, that was a long shoot. I was playing a pretty reprehensible character. Um, I I was also this was after Birdie, so I was getting all the offers that I yeah, I really wanted to do, and I just wanted to, to to be able to do those movies, but I was. Kind of, I kind of felt stuck in that, in that, in that uh, show for a few months. Let's talk about Moon Truck. Uh, moon, moon Truck. Yes, there is no such thing as a Moon Truck, but Moon Truck was a film with Cher. Yes, you can applaud that one. 
they're really fraught for me. Yeah. I don't know why she would see Peggy Sue got married when I'm talking like this and say, I want that <laughs> young man to be my romantic lead in Moonstruck. I mean, they, they, he, I said, to, I actually went up to her house and said, well, well why, Cher, why would you want me? Because well, I saw you in Peggy Sue and I thought it was like watching a two hour car accident and I had to have you. <laughs> I'm still confused by that, but nonetheless, that's exactly what she said to me. Uh, do you remember this as kind of a turning point in your career because of the breakthrough success that it had? Well, Moonstruck was curious too, and that's a great question because I didn't want to make Moonstruck either. Mm -hmm. See, I saw, I saw, I thought of myself as a punk rocker. I wanted to do something with edge and gutsy. I, I wanted to look like someone who snuck into Hollywood. I didn't want to mm -hmm. do a big romantic Hallmark card of a movie. My agent at the time, Ed Lomano, he uh, really wanted me to do Moonstruck, and I wanted to do this very weird little movie called Vampire's Kiss. And he Woo! said, yeah, thank you. Yeah. One of my five favorite strips I've ever read. And he said, no, Nick, I want you to be handsome. I don't want you wearing those stupid, cheap plastic fangs. You have to do Moonstruck. <laughs> and I said, well, if I do Moonstruck, will you I let me do, do Vampire's yeah. Kiss? And he said, okay, so we both got what we wanted. Now, I love Moonstruck. I, I've matured and I think it's a beautiful yeah. film on many levels. But Vampire's Kiss yeah. still remains one of my favorites. Have you always had this gut feeling about things that you wanted absolutely to do? See, I, 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 I felt that with film performance, naturalism for me after Birdie became something of a dead end. Um, I was interested in what you could do on the parameters, on the edges, where could I dance on the margins of film performance. And I started looking back at silent movies and German expressionistic movies like Fritz Lang pictures or Max Schreck and Nosferatu. And I thought, well, I'd like to try some of that choreographed acting in a modern movie. And so movies like Moonstruck and Vampire's Kiss allowed me to do that. And you can, you can go anywhere you want with film performance as long as it's genuinely informed with real emotion. And I also like the golden age actors like James Cagney. And when I did Face Off, I tried to get that energy in the big prison breakout scene with Caster Troy's, you know, it's like Cagney and White Heat, top of the world, my, one of that large kind of Baroque style of film performance. I think somewhere along the way, we all kind of became obsessed with the 1970s style of naturalism, like Midnight Cowboy, which is great. And it's also in movies like Joe or Pig, but it suddenly became the arbiter of what is good, good acting. And I thought we could do more with it. And that's why I started experimenting. I'm a student. I'm a student of film performance. I want to keep challenging where we can go with it. Yeah, it does feel like you're quite intellectual about the craft of yeah, I mean, I, I'm, if you look at it as you're a student and you look at it as what are the, the movies that I saw at an impressionable age, my dad was playing movies like uh, Nosferatu and they were really freaking me <coughs> out when I was five years old, but they left an impression. But if you're a student, you want to try and challenge yourself, whether it works or it doesn't work. Uh, fortunately, I had directors that found a way to make it work, but at least you're learning something. And uh, I think I've pretty much said what I've had to say in cinema, and now I'm thinking about television. <laughs> <laughs> well, at the moment, there's amazing scripts on television. I mean, it's, uh, it's changed from when you started, now where television was where you would go after, but now... Yeah, now this is where, as a student, where I want to yeah. go and learn something. I think you're right. TV now is at a place... Like, I, my son turned me on to Breaking Bad. <laughs> Yeah. And I saw Brian Cranston stare at a suitcase for one hour, and I was like, well, I don't have time to stare at a suitcase for an hour in a movie. Let's do TV. I exactly. want to do that. Exactly. Let's take our time. I want to stare at this bottle of water for an hour and just look at you and look at this. Cut to next episode, you know? It's so interesting that your children, you know, orient you towards things that you end up liking. My son, Cal, he's 18, but he was dead. I think you should watch this. And I sat down, and I, I don't watch TV. And that one I watched, and I got it. I really did. Is he interested in acting? Uh, yeah, more, more singing and, and cooking. Because everyone's a performer in the family. It stays with the hereditary uh, Well, yeah, we all, like I said, I feel blessed that I, I'm in a family of artists. Oh, absolutely.
1995, you won the Best Actor Oscar. I, I know they're going to clap because it was leaving Las Vegas. How do you remember that period of time? And does an Oscar allow you the freedom that you, as Nick Cage, wanted? I think the best way to explain what I I felt the Academy Award gave me, which was that whole period of my life is a bit of a blur, uh, is what we call in academia and in universities tenure. Yes. I felt it gave me some tenure that I could still make movies. And maybe it would give the person that was directing or whoever was hiring me uh, maybe another two minutes before they shot down one of my ideas. <laughs> and maybe they would give me a little more latitude. What happened after the Oscar? So then after that happened, uh, I had already made another movie that was in the can, mm. but no one in town, uh, except for Jerry Bruckheimer, thought that I could do adventure films. And I shot The Rock with Sean Connery. <laughs> and that, that, you know, that was already ready to go. But I wanted to really try my hand at it. Again, the student in me wanted to see if I yeah. could play a Cameron Poe in Con Air, which is nobody, nothing you know, It was, again, a, a learning curve, a challenge, and it worked. It worked a little too well, and I kind of got stuck in that cycle. But, but uh, I'm, I'm now back doing my, my true passion in cinema, which is independently spirited dramas. And as you said, it was the period of the big blockbusters in your career with The Rock, with Con Air, Snake Eyes, 8 millimeters. everybody watched that film? Yes. yes. Was it still learning? What did you find frustrating about doing these types of films or well, not? Well, what, it wasn't so much that it was frustrating. What I learned very quickly with that style of cinema was that you only have a very finite, short amount of time to build a character before you cut to the car chase. So that's what I, I learned, was how to, how to come up with a character. For example, in The Rock, I made him a Beatle maniac. I said, okay, I want, I want to have a scene where I, I, I've spent like 600 bucks buying the vinyl Meet the Beatles album and, and have him bring it to me so we could establish that this character had some, something about him, some idiosyncratic uh, behavior that made him interesting. Stanley Goodsby. Yes. Um, Sean Connery, uh, you, 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 you mentioned John Malkovich. Did it allow you at least, you know, to, to, to co-star uh, alongside actors you admired? Oh, yeah. It's a big, very important for me. Sean was like one of my heroes, and I'm happy to say he was very uncomfortable with me. You know, he was a very kind, he, he, we enjoyed his, our company, you know, I would go to, the, we would hang out and talk about movies, and I'd ask him questions about Dr. No and Goldfinger, I mean, you, 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 can, you can imagine how exciting that was for me, I mean, he's a hero. Yeah, absolutely, and golf, right, you love golf. He was always trying to get me on the golf course, <laughs> and I never, I never did it, because I wanted to get, get on a fishing boat and go fishing, I, there's only so much... Golf takes a lot of time, fishing takes a lot of time, you can't really do both. Uh, there's only so much hobbies you could have. <laughs> only so much time with the hobby, yeah. I want to go back to leaving Las Vegas and what, in your mind, made this role so memorable and worthy of that Oscar? So, I don't know, I mean, I wasn't uh, I, perfectly frank. I, I had made this decision in my mind that I wasn't going to win an Oscar. And I'm going to make this movie because nobody else wanted to make the movie in town. It was too dark. And I said, well, what difference does it make? I'm not going to win an Oscar anyway, so let's do Leave Me Las Vegas. And the reason why that script was so important to me was that I thought it was a really beautiful, cool love story between two wounded people. And um, it, just, it was just so poetic when I read it. And I... Like it's one of the five scripts: Vampires Kiss, Leaving Las Vegas, Raising Arizona, uh, Adaptation, and Dream Scenario. Are the, my five favorite scripts I've ever read in 45 years of doing this. And that one, I knew right away that I could tell that story, and, and I, I cared about both those people. Elizabeth was beautiful and magnificent in the movie, and I just felt for them. 
usually when you win an Oscar, people call you to congratulate you. What was something that resonated with you? Someone who called you and said something that you never forget? Well, the funniest thing was I got a telegram from uh, my uncle. Francis Ford Coppola. And he, yeah. <laughs> And he said, oh, congratulations, Nikki, from Francis Cage, Eleanor Cage, Roman Cage, <laughs> and all the rest of us Cage. Yeah. Yeah. Which was pretty clever, I thought. Kind of cute. Uh, yeah, and a telegram as well, how vintage. It was a telegram, yeah. Very old school. I, would talk I don't about... send telegrams anymore. Yeah, it's Everybody's a shame. texting now. I know. We used to get telegrams from Western exactly. Union. <laughs> Demanding money. <laughs> I tried. It doesn't exist. I yeah, tried no, to exactly. get one. It doesn't, it doesn't, you can't do it. Or handwritten. I like the poetry of anything handwritten. I agree with you 100%. Nobody answers the phone anymore. Yeah, exactly. send you a voice. It's all text. So what are you doing with all those texts? Where are they all going? Are you go, making a documentary about me? <laughs> Uh, because you spoke about stretching the acting exercise, I want to speak about voice acting. I interviewed you for The Croods uh, a few uh, years ago, uh, and Bully, The Spider-Verse, I mean... I, I've done some of it and I think it's great voice acting because it really allows you to express yourself in, in, in many ways. How much do you enjoy that and how much do you see those types of roles, Croods, Croods 2? I love it. I just love it. I like being in the little aquarium that is the, the studio where there's the microphone and you're in a box. Your biggest tool as an actor is your imagination. And believe me, that none of the other actors are there, none of the, the, the location isn't there, and it's all about really using your imagination to make it feel real to you. And so for me, I think, and I would recommend it to fellow actors, it's a great way to stay in shape. Just you know, keep doing it and use your imagination. And I like making movies like that in between my feature films. Yes. And I guess now is a good time to ask, what would you advise a young actor trying to, you know, make their mark in acting the way you did? I would first and foremost tell them to adopt the mantra, it can happen. Mm. And continue, like it and can happen. And don't listen happen. to it can't. Mm. And don't let anyone tell you no. I heard no a lot in high school. You know, uh, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a movie star. No, you're not. <laughs> and don't listen to that. Just, just, it can happen. That's the first thing and stay true to your dreams, and look for folks that you can work with, that you're gonna enjoy your time with them, and also where you're going to be. That's what Martin Sheen taught me. The, only, the most important thing of all is did you like where you were, and did you like the people you were working with? That's very true. <laughs> Do you see yourself more as an actor or a movie star? Well, I don't know what I am anymore. <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah. You're Nicholas Cage! Most often, you're both. Uh, I'm predominantly an actor. That's, that's, that's the way. Well, thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Uh, I, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm someone who's interested in screen performance, and um, I'm an actor. That's what I am. Let's talk about National Treasure. And, uh, the, yes, okay, you love them. Knowing uh, City of Angel, it could happen to you. I mean, these movies were such an eclectic genre. It was so different from one to the other. The experience, the project, the role. Uh, how much did you enjoy each one of them? As a well, that's it, right? Yeah. Keep it the student. Keep it eclectic. Keep pushing yourself to learn. Do not get comfortable. Mm -hmm. I learned that from, believe it or not, David Bowie. I, I, met, I, met, I met David and I, we were in Montreal, he was performing, and I was, I was at one time going to play the Superman character. And, yeah, and I, to me, David was like the Superman, and I wanted him to write the, the, a song for Superman. Mm -hmm. And I said, David, how, how did you do it? I mean... How did you keep reinventing yourself? And he said, I just, I never got comfortable with anything I was doing. And those were words of wisdom to me. You know, just go, the thing that you might be afraid of within reason, as long as you're not hurting yourself and someone else is the very thing you should move towards because you might learn something. 
what do you learn from National Treasure in terms of you know big action adventure? But I love those movies. They're you know they're for the pure entertainment, and I think that is so valid. Well, what for, for me what what that was about was how to make the uh, really kind of ridiculous believable. You know, if you go into a room and you say, I'm going to steal the Declaration of Independence, how do you make that work? You know, it's, it's so absurd. But for me, it was like, find what it is about the character that can convey the gravitas and the reverence that this, this character, Benjamin Gates, has for history. Yeah. And when he says that, that line, it was all about how can I sell it? How can I make it seem like he genuinely means it without looking completely absurd? Good, good. Was there a point where you were like, I don't want to do another mm -hmm. rock. I don't want to do another Con Air. They're offering me the same roles. I have to shift it myself? I think so. I mean, I, I think uh, if you look carefully at the filmography, I was always hopscotching around. After National Treasure, I did Bringing Out the Dead with Scorsese, which I think is one of my favorite movies. Uh, City of Angels, nothing like that. So it was always a matter of trying to stay interested and try different genres. And the gut feeling always told you, this is it, this is where I want to go? Uh, well, I always had a pretty good team around me that would give me their opinions about you really should do this. I think this is a this is a good group of people, but it was about staying interested. You know, the older you get, the more you have to find ways to stay interested. And the way I did that was hopscotching, switching up the genres, and switching up uh, the style of the acting and trying new sounds, new body language, new uh, looks. You know, I'm, I've got a movie coming out, uh, I think in spring next year, called Long Legs. And uh, I'm here to tell you, I, I, I think I'm kind of like a, a nightmare come to life in that movie. Yeah, it's the uh, sequel of Dream Scenario. Yeah, I mean, I'm nothing, I don't look anything like me, and I don't sound anything like me, and I'm pretty happy with that one too. I look forward to seeing it. Is there a genre you wanted to do more of or a genre that you feel, uh, you know, that you enjoy doing the most? My roots are independent, independently spirited dramas. That's my favorite genre. Yes. That's what I, where I came from, that's where I always go back. That is my well, that is my source. And uh, movies like Joe, movies like Pig are examples of that. <laughs> dream scenario which we will talk extensively about and actually is now the surprise film of, of Saturday here at the film festival Very so happy everybody can go there. see I it. Hope you know. I really, I really hope you know. uh, at some point you started consistently producing a lot of the projects yeah. that you started in. How important was that in maintaining your creative freedom? Well so the producing for me is really kind of like inviting guests to a dinner party. Mm -hmm. I want to see what that person's like when they're talking to that person. And so a good example of that was a, a movie I produced called Shadow of the Vampire. I got to put two of my favorite actors together, Willem Dafoe and John Malkovich. Yeah. Originally they wanted me to play Nosfer uh, the, the, the vampire and that, but I wanted Willem right away. And I was so happy with those results. So producing's like that. It's about having a chance to get creative people together in a room and spending time with them. It's a lot of fun. When it's great actors that you star alongside, do you feel it elevates uh, the acting exercise? And how much do you enjoy that, the John Markovich and the will and the flows of this uh, time? It's immense. It's, mm. it's, you, you always want to surround yourself with people who are... You, you never want to be... Uh, intimidated by somebody else's talent. You want to get something from that talent, have, have them bring you to a higher level. You want to foster everyone's creativity. And it only makes you a better actor if you're working with a great actor. Yeah, it's like a great game of sports. I That's hear. exactly right. That's exactly right. Uh, let's talk about your curiosity about non-Hollywood films. I mean, uh, you're one of the first uh, Hollywood movie stars to have gone to several parts of the world for films and who have been curious about all sorts of cinemas. How important is that for you? It's important to me because I grew up on a steady diet of movies from all over the world, mm -hmm. Japan, Italy, um, and my father made sure of that. 
But it's also important to me to go to different parts of the world to make movies. I'm a big believer in what I call the genus loci, which is the mm. genie of a place. You can really feel an energy. I'd like to make a movie here. Yes, you know, like I'd like to. So we would, we would, there would be some sort of harmonic energy convergence and it would bring a great character out of me. You know? So anytime you go to another location and make a movie, you're going to get something from that. The location yes. becomes a character in itself, both in terms of its energy and the way it looks. I want to speak about the uh, unbearable weight of massive talent. Yeah! Yeah! And I have an anecdote for you on it. I was interviewing Brad Pitt um, uh, for one of his films, and then I sat down and he told me, have you seen Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent? It's my favorite film. Are you aware that he's such a fan? I, I'm not, but that's nice to hear. I'm certainly a fan of his, so that would be great for us to do something. Yeah, I think that would be absolutely amazing. Sure, yeah, he's great. Let's talk about the experience of this, of this film and how, you know, crazy in a great way it was to play yourself in different uh, well my agent, my, my <laughs> agent is in the room and he knows that I must have turned that down five or six times there was no muscle in my body that told me to play a character whose name is Nick Cage <laughs> I, I and that was the most high wire act I've ever had to do I was so worried it would be like a Andy Samberg SNL sketch and I, I just I but what happened was Tom Gormican, the director, met with me, and I could tell in the meeting, we met at an old uh, restaurant in downtown LA, and he said, uh, well, I want this movie to have heart, and he seemed like a genuine uh, enthusiast of the, of the filmography. And so I, I knew then that he had more in mind than just some sort of uh, you know, slapstick comedy, like sending me up. Mm -hmm. I, I think he wanted to give the character some heart and some pathos. That relaxed me. Did you have a strategy about how you wanted to play Nick Cage in various elements? Well, I was very happy that the younger version of me, mm. Nicky, was in the movie. That was the part that I had the most fun with, the guy that was in the clip going, Yes, yeah. <laughs> that guy was hilarious to me, and I was excited about playing him. But the strategy, no, I, I, I think it was... Again, it was a matter of play the scenes authentically and, and really care. Like, I, did, I approached it much in the same way I did any other movie, except that I would remind... It got a little surreal, because uh, people were calling me Nick Cage on the set, in the, and the camera was rolling, and I was like, wait a minute, this is really trippy. <laughs> wait a minute, what, am, I, am I doing this? Is this what's going on? And uh, that was different. It was definitely unlike any other experience I've ever had making a movie. I wouldn't yes. want to do it again, but I, I'm glad I tried it. <laughs> the student, you know. Yeah, exactly. That's it. T take this box. Don't do the sequel. We're done. We're not doing any sequels. No more. <laughs> and trippy is a good way to it describe is. this it, film. It was very bizarre. Yeah, no, absolutely. Were you pleasantly surprised of the worldwide uh, great reception? Uh, of I was or? happy. I was happy. You know, a lot of thought went into it even after... You know, the studio had ideas where, which way the movie should go. Tom, the director, had ideas. And at some point, I had to get in the middle and get on the phone with everybody and say, part of what, you got to put Tom's flavor back in the movie. And Tom, that scene doesn't work. The studio's right. But we got there. We all, all of us got there together. So the producer head, basically. The producer head had to shut off the actor head and really look at this in a kind of universal way and, and Ho hopefully we, we managed to get it, everyone was happy with the final result. Let's talk about those five films. So the five best scripts you've ever had. Mm. Dream scenario being one of them. Correct. First of all, okay, see, the, now they want to <laughs> First of all, uh, how do you react when you get one of those? It's like, you know, getting the golden book. I'm usually on the phone with my lawyer, like, like Patrick, you got to make sure this happens. <laughs> don't, don't drop this ball. We got to do this. It's very, very important. Um, and leaving Las Vegas almost didn't happen. I was on the phone with my agent and calling Mike. I really need to make that. I get very passionate. Uh, raising Arizona, I must have read for that movie yeah. 10 times. 
And they'd be laughing, Joel and Ethan, but they would say things to me like, well, we're laughing, but we don't know why we're laughing. And I go, well, good, go with it, just cast me. Well, we could be <laughs> Kevin Cosner or, you know, and I'm like, well, I think I'm your man, you, you, let's do this. Dream scenario. What yeah. did you love most about it? Because we haven't seen it yet, and there's so, such big buzz uh, surrounding it since the Toronto Film Festival. Uh, I think it's one of my, one of two of my favorite movies I've ever made, and I'm so happy that I'm, I was alive to do it. Pig mm -hmm. and Dream Scenario. Uh, I'm going to be 60 next month, and uh, my two favorite movies just happened. Yeah. But Dream Scenario. So I've gotten to this place where I want to be more personal with my choices. I don't know, maybe it's because I was listening to a lot of John Lennon solo albums and I was seeing that his music was getting to a place of deep personal emotion. And I thought, well, maybe I could try that with film performance. And uh, Dream Scenario to me was important because I had gone through this thing, which I'm sure all of you are aware of, which I have coined the word memification. <laughs> Uh, my, when I signed up to be a film actor, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have everyone with a cell phone and a video camera. I wanted to be a screen actor, but then I made the mistake in 2009 of Googling my name. <laughs> and I saw something called Nicolas Cage loses his shit. <laughs> and it just, it was, people just, just cherry picking all these crazy meltdown moments from different movies without any regard for act one or act two or how the character got there. And I thought, well, this is, what do I do with this? I didn't sign up for this. This is, well, that's not what I meant. And then it turned into t-shirts and then it turned into like Pickleless Cage and this and then you don't say and all that. And I was like, I, I was confused by it. I was frustrated by it. I was a little stimulated by it, but I didn't know where to put it. I didn't know where to put it. And then I read Dream Scenario, and I thought, yes, I know how Paul Matthews feels, because he's going through a dreamification where everyone around the world is dreaming about him, and he doesn't know why, he doesn't know what to do with it. So I put my feelings of my memification into Paul's dreamification. I'm here to tell you it's a very personal and satisfying experience. seen it let's you reset the premise so this is a guy that all of a sudden wakes up in the morning and everybody tells him i dreamt of you last night exactly right he doesn't look like me we want to erase so-called yeah. Nick cage he doesn't look like me we changed the shape of my nose got rid of the hair um i i i get more recognized by my voice than anything else so yeah. i gave him a higher voice and um he walks like that and uh he has no interest in being famous. He's not a movie star, he's not a rock star, but lo and behold, this kind of schlubby little professor in a small university wakes up one morning, everybody around the world is dreaming about him. And uh, at first it's fun, it puts a little spring in his stuff, but then the dreams turn into nightmares. And so there's a change, a total change. I don't know if I would call it a comedy. It's something completely different. It's very original. I hope you like it. I, I'm glad it's fun. It's very nice that uh, it's the surprise film, and uh, I'm sure a lot well, of people will see it. I just found out, too. I'm so happy yeah, yeah. that it's here. No, no, absolutely. Because, you know, I think movies like that have to be watched by a communal audience uh, on the big screen. I can tell you that there is, I won't give it away, but I will go on record that I have the most humiliating love scene in all of cinema. <laughs> it's in the movie. Before I forget, I want to go back a little bit to music, as you mentioned, John Lennon. I know music is very important to your art. How did it uh, accompany your career, your love for yeah, music? music is any kind of... So, what, I'm a big believer in art synchronicity, that what you can do in one art form, you can do in another. And that was the other thing that was motivating me to, to look at the edges of film performance. You know, I listened to different music that was more experimental and abstract. I'd look at paintings like Edgar Munch's The Shout. You know, that's yes, in Ghostwriter, yes. the transformation scene. Yeah. Of steel from Edgar Munch. And musically, too, I, I, I like the idea of where you can go with the voice, you know, the, 
sort of the primal therapy that Lenin went through. I put that in bringing out the dead when I'm, I'm having the, I'm in the Sandman's apartment. I start ah, screaming. I got that from listening to uh, Cold Turkey. Uh, you just mentioned Martin Scorsese again. Uh, you know, we mentioned uh, Francis Ford Coppola, all those exciting directors you've worked with. How do you like a collaboration with a director usually? It's very important. Um, and I, I think that now <clears throat> I'm most excited about <clears throat> the younger filmmakers, mm. filmmakers who maybe grew up watching my movies who might be excited about what they can do with me, with my instrument. Um, and that's the case with Dream Scenario, and that's the case with Pig. Uh, I think the younger filmmakers haven't had their dreams whipped out of them yet. They're, they're full of energy and life, and that keeps me fertile. Let's talk a little bit about... I told you, I love them both. <laughs> I like Even it. if they're for I you. I like the smile it brings here. <laughs> Although it's for you, not for me. I, I, I beg to differ. Uh, fame. Uh, I know you're ultra famous and have a following all over the world. Look at uh, you know people who love you so much tonight. Thank you. Thank you all. But I have a feeling that you remain quite private and fame was never something you were seeking. So how well, that, did you manage it? That's right. That goes back to your question about movie star or actor. Mm. The, the, the reason I got into this is I was so inspired by my heroes in movies like James Dean and East of Eden. And I wanted to tell stories. Um, and I think one of the ways that I've, uh, for me anyway, uh, for other people it works, but for me, one of the things that I, avoided with social media because I, I grew up with the, the idea of the romance of the golden age film stars. So yeah. Not too much access. The reclusiveness. Yeah, the, you want to dream you about these people. You don't want to know too much. You don't want to be tweeting every five minutes. So they, then they, frankly, I think they lose their mystery. But I'll do this. I'll meet with you. Mm -hmm. We'll have a conversation like we're doing. I'll meet with folks that like movies, like-minded people who are also <laughs> film enthusiasts. Or I'll go on a talk show. Like you could do a great talk show. I mean, I think that's important. You know, it's it's nice to do that. But 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 the other stuff, I I'm, I I hesitate to touch it. Yeah, no, absolutely. When you're not kind of talking about your craft, uh, everyone's going to ask you about your personal life, and this is not one what one wants, right? Exactly. You want to be able to be mysterious enough that they can still lose themselves in the characters you're playing. You don't want anything you do in your personal life to eclipse that, you know, you don't want them to be talking about you more about the work. However, as you said, the fans are important in the sense that you kind of listen to their feedback, uh, you, you, you follow up what they love I, about your... Um, yes, um, I think somewhere along the way, you know, I, as I was processing what was happening with my mimification, which was mostly the meltdowns and the screaming, the so-called cage rage, um, I, I realized that um, <clears throat> there was perhaps a vicarious experience that was happening. It, it, you know, and the good thing was it kept me in the conversation, but look, we all want to behave. We all want to be great members of society, but sometimes we all want to scream. Yes. So I'm glad that the, the, the memes kind of gave them that release. We all have an id, and so a vicarious release through that is probably why it was picking up. But yes, to go to film festivals like this very successful Red Sea International Film Festival, to meet other folks that want to talk about movies. I get ideas when people talk to me about recommendations. That's great. These are collisions that happen where we can get sparks and get ideas, and, and that's very informative and helpful for me. Is there any movie? <laughs> Any movie you guys are curious about, shout it. Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider. Yes! Tell us a little bit about this one and why you feel the audience responds so well about it. Uh, well, so as a child, 
I always loved the monsters in the comic books. I loved the Hulk, and I loved Ghost Rider. <laughs> and I would read them and stare at them. And why I loved the monsters was that they were scary to look at, and yet they were ultimately doing good. They were, it, was a, it was sort of like my first philosophical experience that this character, Ghost Rider, Johnny Blaze, Yes. Who sold his soul to the devil was actually using that power for good. And that was very complicated. He's not like any other superhero in, in that regard. It, was all, it would almost be like if Disney made one of their pretty little cartoons about Faust. You know, you're never going to see that movie, but that would be an interesting movie. You know, the story of Faust as told by the Walt Disney Corporation. Uh, Ghost Rider for me was like that. With you as Nick Faust. Yeah, yeah, with me going all the way back to that. Let's not get any ideas now. No, I didn't. That didn't happen. It's never too late, you know. You had several of the sources of your career. Yeah. No, uh, uh, so anyway, yeah, Ghost Rider was kind of like a tattoo come to life. It was like that pop art drawing of that sort of the flaming skull. Just the, the coolest looking superhero, you know, on a motorcycle, black leather, skulls on fire. Yeah. Hey, you got it right there. Yay! Yay, Ghost Rider! And it's a, a, a lenticular one. It's reflecting like, uh, like a hologram. That's beautiful. We should get that over here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, okay, look at that. Well, let's have it. Let's have it. Oh my God. Look at that. Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Good Beautiful. point. Do you actually collect memorabilia from your own films? I started doing that just as a sort of way of thinking about my family, like maybe they would like to have it one day, who knows, I just thought it'd be, sometimes I'll go on eBay and see something and go, oh, that might be nice for us to have and put it in the collection. Number one Superman comic. Oh my God, somebody <laughs> took that, they took that from me, they took all my best comics, I'm, I'm waiting for that to come back. That one did come back, but the Batman didn't come back, Aww. Detective 27, that's still out there, my agent's going to help me find it, he, he promised me he would. Comics were your first, um, uh, relationship to the world of fantasy and cinema? I think so. They did, they did a lot to augment my imagination at a very early age. I was just that kid in, in the... I would take comic books and I would cut them up and then I would paste them and draw my own stories and put them in my own comic books and I would just think about them. I think the colors I responded to, I just... Uh, it kind of opened my mind, and I always knew, you know, even at a very young age, that once the technology got there, that the, the comic book movie would ultimately take over the industry, and then it did, you know, so that happened, then that happened, yeah. Thank you. What would you say is the... Sorry, which one? Face Off. Face Off. Face Off is one of my favorite movies I've ever made. Face Off is a, that one might be a masterpiece. That one, yeah, for John Wood But Face Off you was... You just was did his movie 20 years later. Silent Night Yes, with they Joel. got projected here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing Joel tonight. I just did a movie with Joel called Sympathy for the Devil. Oh, and we're back at that again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, uh, he's a lot of fun to work with. I really like my time with Joel. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go back to Face Off and uh, okay. Masterpiece. Yeah, well, what, uh, what about it? Uh, well, it's weird because John Travolta, I remember I came out of Saturday Night Fever in the cinema electrified and I, yes. I b started buying the polyester shirts and wanting to do disco dancing and all that. And I was for about a year Tony Monero mm. in my mind. And I remember I, I was collecting tropical fish and I went to the fish store. I was going to school elementary school at Horace Mann in Beverly Hills, and I went to the fish store, and I remember Tony Monero, John Travolta walking with the pink hands, and I had two uh, uh, buckets of water with fish in them, and I was at the street light, and I was gonna cross the street, and then up walk, or drives this gold Mercedes 250 SL, and in it is John Travolta in a sweatsuit, and he's looking at me, and I'm looking at him, and I'm like, what, 14? Crossing the street, thinking I'm him, and there he is. And then lo and behold, we made a movie together uh, 15 years later. 
weird. But it's a true story, and I told him that, you know. But John Woo was really the person that I, I was so enamored with when we were filming because uh, he showed me his movie Bullet in the Head. And uh, he didn't talk a lot and speak a lot of English, but I knew when I saw that movie where I could go in terms of the size and the opera of the film performance. And that really opened the door for me. And he was right there with me every step of the way. An amazing director. He has multiple cameras shooting all at the same time, the video, video playback, and you could see him. Action, cut, and he's looking at every shot, and he goes, yes, okay, and then he got it. You know, and he's cutting it in his head by looking at all the playbacks. Phenomenal filmmaker, great craftsman. Absolutely, I, I opened up Pandora's box. Let's do one more of these. City of Angels. Yeah. City of Angels. Uh, Vin Vendors directed the yes. uh, the original, um, which is such a beautiful movie, um, Wings of Desire. But what's interesting for me about City of Angels is I was because John Travolta had just come out with Michael, and I, I you know, he's oh he's got wings and he smells like chocolate chip cookies. That wasn't interesting. Mm -hmm. I wanted to create a feeling of eeriness. Like, what would it really be like if there was an angel in your room? And I was developing this attitude of alienness, of otherness. I, I refused to blink. So when I, before I land and I become human, I would do all the scenes without blinking and very still and soft-spoken. And uh, I think the director, Brad Silverling, is like, well, what are you doing? Are you playing the man from Atlantis? What is this? And I said, no, I, I think we're on to something here. But what's interesting is that my next movie was supposed to be Superman. And if you want to know what I would have done with that character, I would have had Kal-El have that alien like Seth, like in City of Angels. And then Clark would have been a lot more amusing. I was going to have a long hair and the glasses and be a little bit more like dream scenario, but I was developing my performance for Kalel when I was playing Seth, so that's just an interesting bit of trivia. Lord of War, yeah, Lord of War. Kick ass! Kick ass. The Lord of War is a brilliant script and all of it is very fact-checked and that it was a conglomeration of different arms dealers in the one character of Yuri Orlov. Uh, Andrew Nichol uh, wrote a brilliant script, and I'm here to tell you, subsequently, I'm gonna do the sequel. So we're gonna bring it back. So now my son grows up, and he's now the king arms dealer, and it becomes very Arthurian. We're sort of battling with each other. I wanna go back to Superman, because I know it's a character you loved in the comic. Why did it never happen if you wanted it so much? I think the studio got scared. You know, Tim was uh, hot off of Mars Attacks, which was a brilliant movie. They wanted uh, uh, Rennie Harlan to direct it, but I knew that if you're going to play that part, you really have to hit the bullseye, and I love everything Tim did with the Batman series, and I'm just a fan of Tim Burton, so I oh, wanted yeah. I, 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 yeah, I argued for Tim and I wanted him to direct me. Uh, but then we got really close, and then the studio called and just shut the whole thing down. I, I think they were afraid about how much it would cost, and they wouldn't get their money back. Well, that's really sad, because I would have really loved you playing Superman under the direction of Tim Burton. <laughs> we had yes. some good ideas. Yeah, we had some good ideas. Yeah. Tim <laughs> no, no, I, no, I have two more questions because we're running yeah, out of time. Sure. The first one I want to know about your philanthropic work because when I was researching uh, for this in conversation, there were a lot of articles about you being very discreet but very generous in your philanthropic work and how important is it for you to use your public image uh, to make positive change? Um, uh, sometimes when you go to different places and you, you, you witness uh, mm -hmm. things that you can't unsee, and they get inside, you want to make a difference. Uh, when I did Lords of, Lord of War, I went to uh, uh, Africa, and there I had met with a lot of child soldiers who were being rehabilitated, and kind of broke my heart. So 
Um, that was interesting to me to try to help out there. But it's not something I talk too much about. It's more private. Um, but yeah, things happen where you have a genuine compassion or care for other folks that are going through something and, and that you see it and you want to try to make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. That's very How do you see the next phase of your career? Because as I said, you know, every few years it's something new for you and that's very exciting because yeah. you've had an extremely eclectic career. You've been able to do what you wanted to do I'm and sometimes not, but you know, that's yeah. the name of the game. Thankful for the opportunities and the people I've worked with. I'm amazed that I was able to realize some of my cinematic dreams in terms of what can be done with film performance. I was blessed to work with directors who gave me the latitude to do it. But I do feel that um, after 45 years and well over 100 movies that I've pretty much said what I've had to say with cinema. Mm -hmm. And the student in me wants to try something else. I want to try a new format. We talked about television. We Maybe there will be some Broadway. I, I don't know, but I want to stay challenged. I'm not saying no to all movies ever again. I'm just saying that my, my selection process is going to be very severe and very stringent. And uh, in the time being, look, I have a 15-month-old daughter at home waiting for me. And I, yeah, and I don't want to keep shrugging her around the world. I want to be home for her. So I think television makes sense for, on a family level, too, if I could be in one place for a few years and be watch her grow up. You know, I'm taking... You know, as you turn 60, you really take stock of what matters, what's important, and time is very important. And how do you want to spend that time? Talking about time with your family, is there kind of a, a repertoire of uh, Nick Cage films that you guys watch over the holidays? We, we don't watch any of my movies. <laughs> Nobody watches my movies in my family. Because they're not. I'm like, come on, guys, go see Dream Scenario. It's in the cinema. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Nope. What do they I feel I feel silly even asking. Uh, I think the, it's television, you know. Yeah, the, Breaking the Bad. Yeah, that. sure. Uh, there's a new cartoon out that's a series called Invincible. That's a big yeah! thing. Uh, so that's a big thing. That's pretty wild. That's wild. <laughs> yeah. And then you sit down and then you, you discover so, yourself. Yeah, that, but it's never my own movies. I don't want to watch my own movies. I want to forget about work when I'm at home. Oh, really? Is it difficult for you to watch yourself? Uh, it's not difficult, it's just I, I've been there and done that. I have nothing to learn from it. I'm looking forward. Okay, that's nice. Well, that brings uh, our in conversation to a conclusion, but thank you so much for being so uh, detailed about I, your career. It's such I, a well, pleasure. I appreciate you having me. I appreciate you all for coming out. I mostly love your smile when you're crying. <laughs> no, I love my heart. I know that you. they're very happy Thanks, to see everybody. You.